greatest lies in Seattle sports history? The first one by default has to be something involving Clay Bennett, the Seattle Supersonics. I don't think there's any debating that. And just the whole idea that they asked us to believe that that ownership group had not really talked about relocating the franchise or when they could relocate it or how it would go about it. Um, I, I will now read, and this came out in the course of the city's suit against the ownership group. On August 17th, 2007, Clay Bennett sent this email to David Stern, and it came after Aubrey McClendon, who was a member of the ownership group, had basically said, we did not buy that team to leave it in Seattle. He was quoted as saying that, and it became this huge deal. Here's what Clay Bennett, and they said afterwards, Aubrey's not speaking for the ownership group. But he told a reporter, he told a reporter that he knew was quoting him that we did not buy that team to leave it in Seattle. This is what Clay Bennett wrote on, on April 17th to, to David Stern. Is there... A, and absolutely, as absolutely remarkable as it may seem, Aubrey and I have never discussed moving the Sonics to Oklahoma City, nor have I discussed it with any other member of our ownership group. <laughs> he said that. He said, and, and to show you the depth of that lie, here is an email that was sent exactly four months prior to that. And it was between Tom Ward and Clay Bennett. Tom Ward was also a member of the ownership group. Ward writes... Is there any way to move here for next season, or are we doomed to have another lame duck season in Seattle? Question mark. Bennett's response: I am a man possessed! Exclamation point. We'll do everything we can. Thanks for hanging with me, boys. The game is getting started! Exclamation point. So it would appear that at the very least, that is discussing the relocation of the Sonics to Oklahoma City four months before he sent an email to David Stern saying that he had never discussed it with any member of his ownership group. A liar! That's generally what owners do, isn't it? And this city has had quite the experience with ownership, whether it's Ken Baring buying the Seahawks away from the Nordstroms and promising that he was never going to try to move the team out of town, only in 1996 to try to move the team out of town. I can't even keep track of all of the names that were in charge of the Mariners before they were able to get the stadium built. Was Similian? Sim Is that how you pronounce his Smoolian. last name? Smoolian. Smoolian. Right. Yeah. Read about him. That's something else. And, and, you said a little bit earlier we discussed it about how this is, I guess, a West Coast thing as far as just the battle between cities and ownership groups of, fo of sports teams as they try to get stadiums built by the county. It's, I think, interesting that Clay Bennett would go that route when this city is so well-versed in the lies that people say when it comes to keeping teams around. All right, so that's lie number one. Biggest lie that's ever been told in Seattle sports was Clay Bennett claiming that they fully intended to keep the Sonics in Seattle. Lie number two, and this one's a little hazier, it's Alex Rodriguez. Everybody will tell you that Alex said before he became a free agent that it wasn't going to be about the money. I, I'm not going to say that that's false. I have not been able to find the direct quote in which he stated that explicitly, in which he said money isn't an object. I did find this quote, and it's from the, the year, the offseason before the final year of his contract, where the Mariners were talking about extending, there was debates about what was going to happen, and all of the, the, the Ken Griffey Jr.'s future, like all of that is sort of coming to the surface. And here is a direct quote from Alex Rodriguez that said, if they go out and get all the pieces, sure, I'd be more than willing to sign with the Mariners. I've always said, that's where I want to be under the right conditions. And the right conditions are having a championship ball club. So that's him entering the final year of his contract. Now that year, they went out and they came. They were two wins away from making the World Series that year. They beat the White Sox in the first round of the playoffs. They played in the American League Championship Series. They, they fell behind in that series to the Yankees. Uh, they tied it at one game apiece after winning the win the opener. They come back after after falling behind three to one. They led the they it was three two and then they lost it. So all 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 of that happened. Did Alex lie? Because then that offseason he went and took 
uh, mammoth offer that was the biggest ma- offer that was made to him. And afterwards he said, Texas really won it, but the Mariners made it a lot easier by the way they treated me, end quote. And did his best through various different sources to paint it as if Seattle had been uninterested and unserious about retaining him. Would you feel that they are unserious about retaining you, though, if you are that kind of a talent and the other team just blew your offer out of the water the way that they did? Because the Rangers were willing to reset the market entirely for A-Rod, who, by the way, at that point, I mean, one of the most gifted baseball players we've ever seen, even if there are some questions about how good he was in the postseason at that point in his career. He was offered, I mean, the offer blew the Mariners' offer way out of the water. I can understand why afterwards A-Rod felt that way, even if that's the incorrect way to feel. Because by those words, that is a lie. He should have He should have just talked about Texas's offer, right? And the problem, and this is a problem a lot of athletes fall into, is that they try to engender support in the city that they're leaving by make it, making it seem there wasn't their choice. That this was something that the, that team did to me. The Mariners wanted him back. They were not willing to give him what Texas gave him. He's not wrong to take the bigger financial offer. The The problem, and I guess I, I don't know if I'd say he full-fledged lied, but he's definitely operating in this gray area of he had told people he wanted to remain on one team. He had said that the biggest thing was winning a championship. Like all of these different things. And then ultimately, well, he went out and the, the, the main criteria of what he did was about the money, the size of the contract, which is fine. But hey, don't then say it wasn't the main criteria. And don't afterwards then say, well, the Mariners didn't really want me because they didn't give me as much money. That, that part, though... I always wonder about the way that an agent will characterize negotiations that they are having with the ownership. Because I bet that Scott Boris, knowing very well what kind of money he wanted to make, probably characterized conversations as, oh, they, they don't even respect you. I mean, and it is interesting how sometimes the way that somebody tells you someone else feels about you, which might not even be true, is going to be more true to you than the actuality of whatever happened then. Yeah, I think that that's very well put, Paul. And that the the truth of that and how Alex was made to believe or interpret all of the different actions. The third biggest lie, the number three lie on this list, is my favorite because it's just the funniest. It's the most hilarious, and it involves Rick Neuheisel. Rick Neuheisel, Rick Neuheisel after the 2001 season, uh, was interviewed... By the San Francisco 49ers. Now, from what I've heard, this interview, which happened when Terry Donahue, who was New Heisel's college coach at UCLA, was the president of the 49ers, included Bill Walsh. Everything I've heard that Walsh was kind of like, I don't know about this guy's football acumen. Like, I'm, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not so sure that he was not blown away by by Slick Rick. But Rick interviews for the 49ers job. He is seen in one of the Bay Area airports. I think it's SFO, but I'm not sure about that. By a guy that I worked with, uh, John Levesque, who was the columnist at the Seattle Post Intelligence Center, and their sports columnist, he's seen in he's seen in in the airport, and so there is a story that's written of hey, Neuheisel looks like Neuheisel interviewed for the for the 49ers job. Neuheisel comes back to Seattle. That's on a Sunday. On the Monday, I the school goes so far as to release a statement saying that Neuheisel did not interview. He was in the Bay Area to play golf with friends and that he did not interview for the job. He goes on the radio and tells one of the people there, I did not, I did not interview for that job. I did not, I did not interview with the San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> it turns out that the, the sports columnist, John Levesque, overheard his phone conversation in which he described the interview with the San Francisco 49ers. <laughs> See, that part of it <laughs> that part of it makes me wonder about so many things. How did he overhear it? Did he proactively go try and overhear it? Or was it just he's walking down the street one day and then here's Rick Neuheisel. Oh boy, 49ers, this would be a wonderful opportunity. Like yelling it at the top of his lungs. All of these things became huge sources of local conversation. Was Levesque eavesdropping? Was he? It was in a public place. He wasn't sitting in a phone booth. He was on a cell phone in the lounge of an. He clearly did not intend to be overheard by a, 
a, a newspaper columnist, but the newspaper columnist is within his rights to just sit there and what he heard and his job's to report the truth. All of these things were funny. It included one of John Levesque's coworkers, also our coworker Jim Moore, <laughs> referring to Levesque in print as the eavesdropper, <laughs> 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 which I don't believe John Levesque particularly enjoyed. <laughs> and Levesque ends up writing a column of like, hey, look, he interviewed for the job. How do I know? Because I heard him talking about it. And then everybody freaks out again. And New Huzzle the next day had to go apologize to everybody <laughs> he lied to. He had to apologize to his boss, Barbara Hedges. He had to call the radio station. He had to call the radio station to say, like, I, I told him his truth. And, it was, and he tried to cover it up by saying that the 49ers had sworn me to secrecy. And I thought in holding up that obligation that it was my duty not to reveal what had actually happened. That's hysterical. It was the funniest lie because it was just so straightforward and he had to come out at the end and say, I got caught telling a fib. I'm really sorry. It was like a 12-year-old got marched around. The highest paid employee of a, of a university of the state is getting marched around to apologize for telling a lie. That's so the that's, most awkward thing. It's the most meaningless but my favorite of those lies.